Welcome to Blue Talks. So when I was young, I overheard my dad telling my mother a story about his day. My dad was a correctional officer and he was fairly new to the job and he found himself in a unit holding somebody deemed to be criminally insane. And this person was in a holding cell, if you can imagine these steel bars anchored into the floor. And this person was interested in something on the other side of the room. So he took it upon himself to break those anchors from the ground and move with that cage. And I remember telling my dad, how in the heck is that even possible? And I'm about 10 or 11 years old. And he said to me, I don't know, maybe nobody ever told him he couldn't do it. Now, those words were kind of lost on, the, on my young mind, but I never forgot them. And today, when I look around, all I see are rules and regulations and mandates slowly chipping away at our ability to critically think for ourselves. They even tell us what we can and cannot put into our own bodies. We have formal rules, state, local, and federal laws telling us what we can do, what we can't do, what we should and we shouldn't do. And then we have our cultural social rules. And depending on how we were raised and what we learned, sometimes if we're not very careful, those things that we can't do become the own, our own bars, our own cages over time. So we create our cages based on social expectations. They're not even our expectations because we teach our children today to memorize. We don't teach them to think critically. So don't stop and think about it. And I know because I'm an educator. So when I was young, I was totally into the metaphysical. At a very young age, my dad gave me a book from Nostradamus. I think I was 12 years old. I don't know if anybody knows who Nostradamus is, but he predicted a lot of things. He's still popular today, you know, several hundred years later. But I was always into the metaphysical. And what intrigued me about the metaphysical was that underlying belief that everything is interconnected. And that's how I drove my life, through that interconnectedness. So I got out of school and I started thinking, all right, what am I going to do with my life? It was a couple years before I decided what to do. You know, I remember my guidance counselor telling me what we do, you go to college, you get a good job, or you go into the military. You get a good job, you get your benefits, 40 years down the road, you retire, and then you get to live your life. And that's all you do, you're just churning out and producing and doing. And that's what was expected, to be a really good contributing uh, member of society. So that's what I did. Except I went into the field of criminal justice because the local community college did not have any courses on the metaphysical. So criminal justice it was, and it was just the logical thing based on what I was told I should do to be that productive member of society. So during the day, I would go to college, I would work in the field, and on the weekends, I still studied those metaphysical things. Early on, I was learning about shamanism and that interconnectedness. And then over time, by the time I got to graduate school, I really wanted to merge the metaphysical self with the physical self, that interconnectedness, to really bring in a new way of thinking around and create a human-centered approach in the criminal justice field. And my graduate professors treated me like I was totally nuts. That's not the way it's done. This is the way we've always done it. Um, but I wanted that human-centered approach where we really spoke to their innate ability to connect with their true selves. And I feel like that's what's lost in society today. We're disconnected from our true selves. We wear these personas based on the expectations of everybody else. So over time, what happened was professional Barb by day, following the rules, getting the degrees, doing everything that society expected me to do. And then over here was spiritual Barb, 
having a blast on the weekends. It's really where I was at. And I would try to get them a little closer, a little closer, closer, and then I'd get ridicule. No, that's not, that's not how it does. That's not how it's done. We just teach people the rules and then we punish them if they don't follow them. That's how it's done. So I kept my studies on the side and I kept the two sides of me separate for years. And I went on with my education. And then I found myself in 2014 very tired. I'm like, what is the matter? So what did I do? I took some iron supplements and I kept on pushing. I was at the gym at 5 a.m. I was working full time. I had that dream house. I had the horses, I had the chickens, I had the dogs, I had the life I thought I wanted my entire life. I had worked for it. I was 46 years old and I had it and I'd made it. And then come to find out I was in bone marrow failure. My body was shutting down on me. I had, was not making enough blood to survive. And sooner than later, they said, all right, the only way you're going to survive is to have a bone marrow transplant. If you don't have the bone marrow transplant, and this is the paper I had to sign, you get a 20% chance of not living another year. So I was like, okay. Bone marrow transplant it is. Three months away at minimum. And that broke my heart because I would have to leave my animals. And I didn't want to leave my animals. So I went and I did it. And when I was in the hospital, spiritual Barb actually took a front seat. And I'll tell you, I was bitter, I was mad, I was angry, and I was in self-pity. But spiritual Barb took a front seat. When that phone rang, I knew who was calling. I had a lot of prophetic moments where I just knew I had flashes and insight. I was like, this rocks, because why? I wasn't doing, I wasn't constantly doing one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. I wasn't meeting social expectations. I was being, and I was being me. It was a beautiful thing. Now fast forward three months, the doctor said, Barb, I know you should have blood by now. I don't know what the hell happened, but you don't. It's not working, I'm gonna send you home. And I slowly started to realize that my time on earth was gonna be ending sooner rather than later, and I accepted it. So for the next three, uh, the next year, the only thing that kept me alive were blood transfusions. Every two to three days, I got a bag of blood. And this whole time, my, my inner wisdom, my intuition was screaming in my ear, tell your doctor to change your medicine. So I told my doctor, please, these immunosuppressants are not agreeing with me. And the doctor said, you need to have them. If you go into graft versus host, you will die. And I said, okay. So a year later, July to July, he finally said, okay, we have a new immunosuppressant. We're going to switch it. Now, by then I'd already accepted that my time was almost up. You can't keep living on bags of blood every two to three days. And in three months, my blood were up, was up to the normal levels. It was that damn medication that kept me held like that for an entire year. So throughout this process and throughout my life, I've noticed that myself and the people I worked with in the criminal justice system, they moved in and out of four stages of being. And I kind of put them in two buckets. There's the bucket of limitation, limited, consciousness, and that is separation from your true self, something we're not taught as kids. And then on the, on the other bucket is expanded consciousness or a state of expansion. And that's where you're living from your heart, from your true self. So the first one in limitation is victimhood. And I aced the heck out of that. I aced it. I was such a victim. That world was working against me no matter what I did. I couldn't get it right. I was cursing God. I was cursing everyone. Doctors, I was bitter, I was angry. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Blaming somebody else. You're not accountable to anybody. That's how I was in the hospital. And that's how I was when I was dealing with my graduates 
professors who said, you can't do that stuff. You can't prove that stuff scientifically. So you have no business, talk, business talking about it. And when you're in a state of victimhood, this is where your itty bitty shitty committee runs your life. That's the, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not thin enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not enough, period. They are running your life. This is where imposter syndrome lives. I think we've all had imposter syndrome, right? You finally made it, you did a great job, and then something says, ah, uh, no. If the world really found out about the truth. But then sometimes we get out of that state of victimhood and we move into this state of false empowerment. And I say it's false empowerment because we truly are empowered, but we're empowered based on our status, our titles, our possessions. Our whole life revolves around accumulating things. And it's based on what other people think about us. It's meaningless. Because when I was in the hospital, my PhD meant nothing. My house meant nothing. My car meant nothing. It was the human connections that meant it all. That's where it was. Why do we have so many identity crises? It's because we are focused on the outside and not on the inside. So I hope none of you all get hit by that, you know, spiritual Mack truck like I got hit by, and you start to realize if you are living in limitation, that there are things that you can do. You can question yourself. You can start to think about how you're living your life, and you can start making changes in your life. And it's really just about getting in touch with who your true self is, and that's where the state of expanded consciousness comes in. Because then you live in wholeness. And when in, you're in wholeness, you realize that you are connected to everything. Now, years and years and years ago, when I was studying all this, it was just pseudoscience. Today, we have science to back that interconnectedness. So in wholeness, the itty bitty shitty committee cannot exist. It can't exist. There's no dimension there for it. You don't care what other people think because you don't measure yourself based on what other people think. You measure yourself on how you feel and you are full of compassion and you're connected. And that's how we all should be. We should all be connected. And then the last state is multidimensionality. And that's just one step further than wholeness. It takes you a little bit past, well, I know I'm connected to your experiencing those connections. It's like you're in touch with your guides. You're talking to your guides. And your guides are answering you back. When I came out of the state of victimhood, I asked my guides, I said, I've done it all. I've checked all the boxes. What more can I do? What am I supposed to do with my life? And they said, Barb, you came here to break the bars. I'm like, are you kidding me? I spent my whole life in the toxic criminal justice system and it doesn't budge. And they weren't talking about the criminal justice system. They were talking about the bars that were holding me in limitation. That every time somebody said, no, you can't do that, I played small. I played small rather than pushing back and trying to expand their awareness and their, their consciousness. So can you imagine the world that we can create if our creators created from a place of wholeness, from a place of interconnectedness, where we know that whatever we do is for the good of all and it impacts the good of all. You know, working in the criminal justice system, I swear our lawmakers think that, that we can just legislate our way to a better society. But I contend that the better society comes from empowering young people to know their true selves. And early on in my shamanic studies, that's what we talked about, our true self. This is nothing but a dream, according to them. Our true self is on the other side. And I believe our next level leaders will be stepping into that role from a place of wholeness. They are the real change makers coming forward. 
So I started this story, this talk about a story about my dad. And I'm going to wrap it up with a story about my dad. And it beautifully illustrates how we truly are connected in the field, which science will prove. So on May 31st of last year, my sister called and she said, dad's in the hospital. He's, he's stable. There's no room for him yet. When he gets a room, they'll put him in the room. You can call him in the morning. And I was like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Now I'm one, I'm asleep by 10 o'clock. 12 o'clock, I'm still awake. And I said, oh, I can, I can talk to dad in consciousness. What, what's the matter with me? See, that's where part of that divide was. We never met, you know, the spiritual and professional. I didn't really fully bring it into my family either. Then I said, I can talk to him in consciousness. And the instant I said that, he was there. And in hindsight, I think my dad was pulling me in. My dad was pulling me in. So anyway, I said, Dad, hey, we can talk in consciousness all the time. And you know, it was kind of a relief because my dad was really hard of hearing and talking on the phone was really hard. But when we were in a state of that expanded consciousness, we hurt each other mentally. There was no words, we just hurt each other. And I said, we can talk to each other like this at any time. And I said, in fact, you can talk to anybody you want to in this state of consciousness because we are all connected in the field. And he said to me, oh yeah, in a way that, you know, like a dad who already knows the truth, but he wants to let you think like you're telling him something he didn't know. He said, well, then I want to talk to John. And John was his best friend who had passed away several years earlier. And the instant he said that intention, he said, I want to talk to John. John was there. And the two of them started talking. And I'm starting to think, is, is, am I having a waking dream? What is really going on? But then I checked with my mom later, and it turns out what I heard was an inside joke that was private between the three of them all those years. And then I said, okay. And then I started to feel myself pull back. So as I pulled back, I became more of an observer than an active participant. And I saw my dad and he was very happy. And my grandfather came in, my uncle came in, but then my grandmother came in. My grandmother died when I was in third grade and that was very, very difficult for the family. And I saw them embrace and I saw them begin to walk away. And I went into a panic. I said, this cannot be real. This is a dream. I'm, I'm got to be sleeping. This is not real. And he didn't answer me. And then the phone rang. And it was my sister telling me that the hospital had contacted her 15 minutes prior and my dad's heart had stopped. They had spent the last 15 minutes trying to revive him. And I said, Corey, I just saw him leave with grandma. He's not coming back. So we talked for 15 more minutes, the hospital called back and they said we couldn't bring him back and we called the time of death. And that's how I know that we all have that innate ability if we just break the bars that confine us and we step into our true selves. So today, I'm still a criminal justice professor and that's all good, but really I run Disrupting Gracefully. And that's, that's where my heart is. And I wanna work with those next level leaders who are connected to their multidimensional self and who just need that little extra boost to pu push themselves into that leadership role. So they're leading with grace, grace being connected to their heart and disrupting on purpose, disrupting the status quo, disrupting and breaking down those systems that have hold it, held us all in limitation out of the need for social control because we are so powerful. Thank you. <laughs>